So without further ado, let me uh, share my screen and I will start telling you uh, about my story with Afghanistan. Uh, so let's just zoom on past that one and on to the next. So yes, uh, well, <laughs> going all the way back, um, my story in travel really. Uh, so in 1991-92, I drove a motorbike right the way around the African continent. It was a journey of some 20,000 miles, took in 20 countries, took about 10 months to complete. Um, as you can imagine, it was a fairly epic journey. Uh, Travelling by motorbike across that continent back in those days was, was a, an absolutely amazing experience. As the story included my quest to become a rock singer and two wonderful young ladies, um, I was advised to write a book about this story. Now, evidently, those that asked me to write a book about it didn't understand that I um, had failed English O level five times. Um, that's because I'm dyslexic and found that sort of thing rather tricky. But anyway, one thing I'd learned on this journey was that if you try very hard to do what you want to do, you can probably achieve it. So I sat down for a year and I wrote my first book, Running with the Moon, about that journey uh, around Africa. And much to my surprise, it was rather successful which then put me in a new kind of quandary. Was I a writer? Um, as I say, the thought of me becoming a writer from my school days was pretty ridiculous. But on the other hand, I thought, well, what could be better? What would be a better way of life for a young man uh, than to go off and do another journey? And I knew immediately what I wanted to do. Um, this was to follow in the footsteps, of, uh, the fictional footsteps of my heroes from English literature, Peachy Carnahan and Daniel Dravel, Dravit two lovable rogues from Roger Kipling's wonderful short story, The Man Who Would Be King, as they traveled from the heat and dust of the plains of India up through the Hindu Kush in search of Kafiristan, you know, what could be a more romantic journey. Uh, so I pitched it to the publishers without really any thought as to what that might mean, traveling into an active war zone with absolutely no knowledge of where I was going or what I was doing. Um, and much to my alarm, they said, yeah, sounds like a great idea, off you go. So I donned my turban, grew a beard and headed off to the Hindu Kush, as you do. Um, now, this is the, the, the region here in red, you can see, which is uh, today called Nuristan. The journey itself started in a place called Mawa Junction. Roger Kipling's story begins three long summers and a thousand years ago. Uh, in Marwa Junction, which is a, a little train station in Rajasthan, kind of in between Udaipur and Jodhpur. From there, I traveled up to Delhi. I went up, hitchhiked up the Grand Trunk Road, crossed the border between India and Pakistan, uh, between Amritsar and Lahore, and then traveled up to Peshawar. Um, and, and then over the Khyber Pass and into Afghanistan. Now, perhaps at this stage, I should just explain a little bit about the background of Nuristan and, and exactly what is significant about this particular place. So if we go back into the 19, uh, into Kipling's era, really, the Victorian era, um, the, the, the name Kafiristan means land of the unbelievers. And it's this area more or less in red, but it did cross the border over into Pakistan. What you have to remember is back in those days, this border didn't exist. It was simply called the Northwest Frontier um, to the British and evoked painful memories of the first Afghan war uh, and a number of other um, situations. So there was no border. Uh, and this also caused a problem for the king of Afghanistan, a chap called Abdul Rahman, because the pagan tribes that lived here, these, these Kafirs as they were known, which of course means unbeliever, um, and hence the name Kafiristan, um, were known for their warlike ways. They venerated wine, they drank vast quantities of it, they worshipped a war god called Indra, and they would come down out of the mountains um, for raping and pillaging and dragging the locals back off up into their mountain lairs as slaves. And this was, of course, giving Abdul Rahman something of a hard time. So in 1896, the British um, designated a chap called Henry Mortimer Durant to draw up the border between what was then British India and Afghanistan. And this was the border that he did, as you can see, going through the P there of Peshawar up into the kind of turtle's head of Afghanistan, which of course is the Wakhan Corridor, which we'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, so he drew this up, but it didn't go neatly kind of go round Kafiristan it, and it didn't go right through it. It, it went through 
a kind of nine eighths of it, leaving a tiny bit on the Pakistan side. So this left Abdul Rahman with the opportunity to go into his side of the border and, um, and convert the locals in what was probably the last forced mass conversion in history. He sent his armies in there. He converted the Nurist, the, 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 the Kafirs uh, to Islam and changed the name of the province from Kafiristan to Nuristan, meaning land of light or land of the enlightened. What he what the border did, though, was also leave a tiny little bit of these pagan people living on the Pakistan side of the border, then British India, protected by British India. And they, of course, are still around today. We'll talk a little bit more about them a little bit later. They are called the Kalash and they um, yeah, they live in the borderlands in Chitral province, just to the right of where that red marker is. Um, so that was the kind of history of Kafiristan slash Nuristan. Um, it was a place that was renowned still for its pretty dangerous ways. In fact, in Kipling's time, the term Kafiristan was a synonym for suicide. Um, and of course, that's where Kipling set this story of these two lovable rogues, and they came to a tricky end, as um, I'm sure most of you will know that have seen the film or, or read the book. Um, just to jump forward to my time um, and to put the walk into perspective, given the kind of history of where we are today and where we were then, um, what's read here is more or less what the Taliban controlled in um, the summer of 1996 when I set off to do this journey. It's not quite right, this map, because if you can see where Peshawar is on the right going up to Kabul, that road was still run by what was kind of the Northern Alliance or, or, or groups of warlords um, on that side. They, it wasn't run by the Taliban. Very quickly after I finished this journey in September, the Taliban took Kabul and very quickly took most of the rest of the country. Uh, 1998, they had almost all of it and the Northern Alliance was left with this tiny little bit up in the far northeast, Badakhshan and the Wakhan Corridor. So that gives you an idea of kind of where the Taliban was when I was doing this, uh, this particular trip. Now, my first port of call was to Kabul. Um, of course, you don't just grow a beard, put a turban on and go wandering off into the Hindu Kush. You need to find people that know what they're doing, that can speak languages. You need porters, you need all sorts of things. And, and I was advised to go into Kabul to try and find these people. Kabul at the time um, was a bit of a mess. This was the street that journalists used to love to, to, to kind of photograph. It was called Jadi Maiwan. It's a big street in central Kabul. And it had been pretty much blown to pieces by different Mujahideen factions uh, during the kind of ensuing civil war after the Russians had left. Um, there were quite large parts of Kabul that were actually completely fine. I stayed in a, in, a, in a nice house in one of the suburbs. But this is the kind of image that most people had of Kabul back in those days. Um, the first person I met was a chap called John Hayward. Uh, John was an aid worker, British aid worker living out there. I asked him if he wanted to come with me. I was kind of put in touch through a friend of a friend. Uh, and he said, absolutely, he would love to travel into Nuristan. John, John came from a, a good lineage of explorers. Um, his great great uncle was a chap called George Hayward, who was a winner of the Royal Geographical Society's gold medal for exploration and was a player in the great game, the famous war of attrition between Tsarist Russia and British India as they kind of vied for control over Central Asia. He, he was uh, on, a, on a scouting mission looking up the passes in northern Kashmir uh, in what is today Pakistan, but unfortunately 1870 he was murdered up there and his uh, body is, is in a cemetery in Gilgit, which I'm sure some of you will have already been to. Um, so John was my kind of main, main kind of partner in this, um, but of course even though John spoke pretty good Dari, uh, that wasn't going to help us that much in Nuristan. There's a whole host of languages that get spoken there. Uh, so we needed to find both somebody to help our security, because it was a dangerous place, and also a translator. Haji Pordal was the security man. He was an ex-Mujahideen fighter, and I thought anybody that can fight off Russian helicopter gunships can probably keep us safe through Nuristan, and so it proved. A lovely man. I'll talk a little bit more about him uh, as we go through the talk. Um, and we put together a group. Ishmael is the chap on the right, standing kind of uh, uh, the tallest one on the right. He was our translator, a Nuristani uh, and an Afghan, uh, sorry, and a Pakistani um, uh, he, 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 a refugee. He'd come over. I actually met him in Peshawar, not in Afghanistan, but he came back 
and helped us as we traveled through Nuristan. And the rest of these guys here are a motley crew of porters that we managed to, to find uh, in Jalalabad and kind of uh, Kunar province uh, to help us carry our bags up through the mountains. So this is how we set off. Um, now we got to a place called Metalam, which is in Lagman province, which was the last village before we crossed the Karak Pass into Nuristan. And this is really getting into quite a remote part of Afghanistan. Um, when we left this village, the road finished. There was just a trail and we didn't hear a combustion engine for another 36 days until I came out and was back in Pakistan. There were no roads at all. I believe that's not the case anymore. But in those days, there was no road. Um, and what we had to do to work out how to travel through Nuristan, because we were going to travel across the four uh, valleys. There are four valleys that make up Nuristan. And, and, I, and I'll show you a map of that a little bit later on, is that you find the headman of headman of one village. You sit down and you have gub shop, as it's known, you chat with him and sit and have tea and perhaps something to eat. And you take quite a few hours doing this as you um, get basically his blessing to write a letter from him to the headman of the next village saying, you're OK, your friends uh, carry on. This is how it had been for centuries. I suspect they're now all on WhatsApp and they'll just do it that way. But back in the mid 90s, it was still a matter of writing letters putting it in an envelope, not sealing the envelope, because if you'd sealed the envelope, you wouldn't know what was written on the letter, and then walking up to the next place, finding the head man and delivering the letter. And so you'd be passed from place to place. And that's what we did. However, when we got to our, we kind of left him eventually, walked up the valley, got to the, you can see in the background of those pictures, some stone corrals. We, we got up there, which is the kind of just below the mountain pass, which is where some of the young men were, were, were doing uh, grazing their flocks and stuff. Um, he, he evidently didn't trust us to leave his jurisdiction. So he sent up four of his gunmen to make sure we did leave. At the time, we weren't really that sure what his gunmen were doing. And John was quite nervous that, the, that this guy had, had kind of sent us up there to, to do something worse than that. I should add at this point, a friend in Jalalabad um, put a, 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 a pistol and a ammunition in my hand, which he, he kind of handed me and he made this lovely comment. He said, uh, trust in Allah, but tether your camels at night, thrust these guns and this gun and, and ammunition into my hand, which I kind of put in my pocket. So that night sleeping in one of these corrals, listening to these guys whispering, I kind of had my hand on my pistol, not really knowing what I would do if one of them did drag me out in the middle of the night. Thankfully, it didn't happen though. And we woke up the next morning at four o'clock, um, which was usual because Haji, uh, who you can see here um, sitting cross-legged, um, sang the Azam, which is something he did every morning. He had had a really interesting story in 1991 with the first Afghan, sorry, the first um, Iraq war. Um, the Americans had put together a coalition of Afghan Mujahideen as a kind of publicity stunt, really, to show that there were plenty of um, Muslim fighters in the battle against Saddam and sent them to Iraq. They never got anywhere near the front line. They were sent back to Afghanistan, but in, in, in honor of their service, they were all given a brand new Russian Kalashnikov, which was, which was um, Haji's pride and joy. And most of these Kalashnikovs you see here were all Pakistani or Chinese, which are, are pale into, into insignificance compared to the Russian ones. So Haji was very proud of that. Um, and they'd also allowed people to go to Mecca. Uh, so he had become a haji. So it was his kind of job to be the spiritual leader of our party. And every morning, wherever we were, he would stand on a rock and sing the azam, the morning call to prayer, which was absolutely beautiful when you were up there on top of the mountains with the mist swirling around and it, this, this ghostly sound. Of course, it did mean it was four o'clock in the morning. You had to get up and have a very arduous day climbing over mountains. But for that moment in the morning, it was beautiful. Um, so that's what we did. We got up the next morning and we walked up through towards the top of the Carrick Pass. Um, and this is a 4,500 meter pass that leads you into Nuristan. Now, I am a farmer's boy from Lincolnshire, which is about 20 meters above sea level, I suspect. And this was the first time I'd ever climbed over a high mountain pass. And I have to say, I found it very, very difficult. Luckily, John uh, was a seasoned mountaineer and climber 
And he showed me how to walk in the mountains, taking tiny steps as you just kept going. And that made a really big difference. Um, the headman uh, uh, gunman followed us all the way, about 200 meters behind us, just to make sure we did leave his jurisdiction alive, I guess, um, and, and, and to see us into Nuristan, which again made John rather nervous. But we got down into Nuristan and, and this is the journey that we've been looking for. Now, if any of you re have read Eric Newby's Short Walk in the Hindu Kush, you will know that he came over the same pass as us, uh, I believe, traveled up through um, through uh, the, the uh, Ramgul Valley, um, past uh, Lake Mandal, which I'll show you in a minute, and then veered off to go and climb Mount Mir Samir. So we carried on up that first valley. We went down to the second valley to Wama, up over the Papruk Pass, down into uh, the Metalan Valley, and then out into Afghanistan, uh, out into Pakistan. So we were traveling over four different valleys. And this was the classic kind of scenery that you'd see very steep, very narrow mountains, very arid, very little forestation in a lot of it, uh, and the terraced fields that had been irrigated by water to produce maize and feed the animals, uh, etc. Lake Mondal, Eric Newby um, describes it very, very vi uh, vividly. Um, beautiful, beautiful turquoise lake. When we came around the corner, we heard explosions and we weren't quite sure what it was, whether people were, were making water channels or whether it was something more dangerous. When we actually kind of got around the corner and saw what it was, it was um, a, a bunch of Afghans were pulling pins out of hand grenades, chucking it in the water, where there were two young lads in little dinghies, little wooden dinghies, picking up the dead fish. It was fishing Nuristani style. So we carried on and we got to the first headman's village. And this was this chap. Um, and the Nuristanis, they're a tricky bunch, if I'm being perfectly honest. They're kind of renowned for being fiercely independent. They've taken to their uh, new religion with the fervor of a new convert. Um, and they're not easy people to kind of, um, you know, get along with. This chap's face kind of rather sums it up. Um, however, he welcomed us in. Um, we stayed for the night. This was his little village and his home. Um, and that first night, I lay on the floor in his guest room. Most of these houses have a little guest room for male people to come and meet each other. Um, I lay down and half an hour later, I started scratching and I wondered what was the problem was. And uh, I kind of put my torch down and saw that I was absolutely covered in, in, in bed bugs. So I went outside, kind of brushed myself off, tried to get rid of as many of them as possible. And I never slept inside a Nuristani home again. They were, they were pretty rough old places. Um, but that of course caused another problem because I was lying on the rooftop and, a, and a, I woke up and my blood ran cold. It was a great big, enormous shepherd dog muzzle was kind of nuzzling my, my face here. And I, you know, they're fierce dogs. They're deliberately fierce so that they keep the wolves and, and things like that away. So anyway, luckily it did nothing and wandered off. So I did eventually get back to sleep. Um, and so it was that we just walked up these valleys. Um, you would go past a couple of little villages uh, as the higher up the valley you got, as you kind of passed about 2000 meters, you would get past the last village and then you'd be up into the high mountains and you'd get up into what are known as the Ilax, which are the summer high summer grazing place where the young men go, they, they, they practice transhumance, they take all the animals up in the, in the summer months, they milk their animals, their goats, their, their, their cattle, their yaks, uh, they turn it into butter and cheese, which they then take down into the villages um, for the winter months. This was one particular corral that I slept in, about 4,200 meters just below one of the passes, and then we'd walk over the pass the next day. Um, and we'd cook on, on dung fires, dung left by the animals. Um, we took with us flour, sugar, tea, mostly things that we could trade with local villages, things we thought they would need that they didn't have. Um, and then often in the villages, they would either I remember in one place they, they, they killed a couple of ducks, which was delicious, but in another they killed a very old goat, which was completely inedible. <laughs> um, and a third place I remember in this lovely little uh, village, they produced um, melted cheese like a, like a fondue, which was uh, fantastic. So the food was varied, but I should say I lost about two stone, ended up at 10 and a half stone. So whatever that is in kilos, I'm not sure. But yeah, I, I lost a lot of weight on this, on this particular trip. Um, 
And so we carried on in our journey. We came to a place called Mangul, where there's a famous rock called Mullah Halal. The year before um, Abdul Rahman sent in his full troops to convert everybody, he'd sent in a, a preliminary group of 30 mullahs to try and persuade the kafirs to convert to Islam. The kafirs were having nothing of it and slaughtered all the mullahs on this particular rock. And it said that there is stained blood on the rock, the mullah halal. They got their comeuppance a year later when, of course, Abdul Rahman's full force of his army went in and converted them all. Um, in Kantiwa, which was a village um, about halfway through our journey, we had a, an interesting experience. Um, the headman of this village was a chap called uh, Abdul Rahim, and his brother, Haji Gafur, was in Kabul and was a close partner of a chap called Gulbatin Hekmatyar, who any of you that follow Afghan politics will know who he is. And he was opposed to Masood and, and Rabani, um, who were, of course, in power still in Kabul at this stage. They lost power about a month later, but they were still in, in, in power here. And the main reason why Abdul Rashid was, was so worried was um, because uh, an, an ITN cameraman had been murdered here a little while earlier. And he, he, we were about the first Westerners to come through since. And of course, he was paranoid that we were uh, investigating uh, this guy's murder, which we obviously weren't. Uh, and so he was radioing frantically his brother in Kabul to work out what to do with us. We knew we were being held because we were put in a room with chicken wire on the windows and nobody offered us tea. In Afghanistan, if you're not offered tea, you're probably being held captive. Um, but bizarrely, something very weird happened. And, and I don't really know quite how it came about. Um, what I do know is that um, we found out later, John found out later that Masood, who was over the border in, in the Panjshir Valley, uh, was apparently preparing helicopters to come and get us out should he needed to have done. But it didn't need to be done because um, Ishmael here, our translator, turned out to be the son of uh, Abdul Rashid's best mate at school. And they all got chatting and found out that they had this great connection and everything was thawed and we were all completely then fated. They killed a goat, they, they served us tea and, and our, our kind of kidnap situation or, or our being held lasted for no more than about three hours. Um, so that was a big relief. So we, we kind of carried on from there um, on our way out towards Wama. Now here, and I should say, you know, this place it is renowned for being dangerous. It, it is dangerous. Uh, on this journey, we came across about 12 different murders we heard of, both in front of us and behind us. Um, while we were in Wama, this is Wama by the bridge at Puliwama, and then you go up to Wama 300 meters up above. Um, I was invited up there by this chap on the right, the musician, who said, do come up and stay. Uh, we went up there and we sat on his balcony. This is a classic Nuristani, you know, hilltop village where the roof of one forms the veranda of the next. Uh, we stayed up there and, um, and, and I was sitting here and a few moments later we heard bullet shots ring out and, and kind of splatter the ground below us. Uh, and he grabbed me and, and threw me into, into the room and, and started laughing. And, and I said, what, what's so funny? And he said, well, you mustn't be, you mustn't be, be worried, but um, we have a culture here that the best way to hurt our enemies is to kill our enemies' guests. And that guy's my enemy over there. I kind of wished he'd told me that before he dragged me 300 meters up above the river. But never mind, no harm done. Uh, the only time in my life I think I've actually, actually actively been shot at, but um, luckily the guy uh, missed by a fair way. Um, and so we continued into the Paprok Valley, which was absolutely beautiful and had no sense of danger at all. The people here were very agricultural. Uh, they lived just on the land. They were very calm. There were no guns. Suddenly all the Kalashnikovs that every single man had been carrying that we'd met before that didn't have any. Um, we were invited in for to stay with a couple of families um, and it was it was gorgeous. They actually have their own language, which is interesting because it's very geographically based their language. It, it, it doesn't have any relevance. If two men from this valley meet in Jalalabad, they can't use their language um, because it's all based around the geography of the particular valley. Um, but that was great. We also came across the Garden of Indra, which is a famous place here, which is a 400 acre uh, orchard of, of fruit trees and stuff. And in, in it, we found these amazing old wine vats. As I said at the beginning, the old Kafirs venerated wine. 
um, and, and, and the Kalash on the other side of the border still do, and they used to have wine festivals, and this was one of their wine vats, which of course you put the grapes in the bottom there, jump up and down, squash them, and the, the, the juice would come out, which they would then um, ferment into wine. Um, and as we got towards the Pakistan border, I had to say goodbye to Haji. Uh, the porters had already scarpered. They they had enough. They would basically they'd had altitude sickness. They were scared of being in Nuristan, and so they'd left, which left Haji and me and John and and uh, Ishmael to carry on. At this stage, John decided he wanted to go in a different route out of Nuristan. Haji um, decided that he didn't want to go into Pakistan because they were worried about getting caught by security by the immigration people. So he left and, and I had a, a, a kind of fond farewell with Haji. He'd been probably my, my kind of best connection on that trip. A lovely guy, have no idea what happened to him after this trip, but, but a really, really top, top man. Um, and so I carried on just with Ishmael out over the, what's called the Ganglebat Pass uh, and reached the top of that pass. And I remember getting there and just standing on the edge of Pakistan, uh, on the edge of Afghanistan, looking down into Pakistan thinking, you know, all that fear, that built up fear of having been in this dangerous place for the last 36 days was finally behind me and came down over the three, uh, 4,650 metre pass into Pakistan and to the valleys of the Kalash. And these are the last of the pagan tribes to inhabit the Hindu Kush. Some in Pakistan will call this Kafiristan. The Kalash don't like that because they believe they do have religion. They have their, their animistic pagan religion. Um, but they're an amazing people. And I, I just loved it so much that I ended up staying three months with this man, Saifullah Jan, um, who is the chief spokesperson for the Kalash. I'm sure there are people on the webinar tonight who have been there and have met Saifullah. Um, and he still keeps in, oh, well, I say still keeps in touch. He's still a great mate. We still run lots of trips to his particular place because it was he that came up with the idea for setting up Wild Frontiers. Um, so after I'd written my second book about this journey for a pagan song, um, I then set up a tour and uh, launched trips to Pakistan in 1998. Um, and with the exception of two years after 9-11, 2002 and 2003, we've been running holidays, adventures in Pakistan ever since. And it's becoming, once again, really, really popular at the moment, which is fantastic. So let me just very quickly, before I bring in our two guests, just tell you a, a, about the two um, tours that we then set up in Afghanistan. Um, obviously, traveling around Afghanistan, and I, you know, as I said, I've been to Kabul a couple of times and, and different parts as well, I knew that it's just this fascinating country. And as soon as we could run trips there, we did. So we set up the Afghan Explorer in 2005, which kind of used Kabul as the hub of the bicycle wheel, if you like, it's obviously big distances to travel and also the roads back in those days were pretty dodgy. So we would use Kabul as a hub and fly to Herat, to Bamiyan, to Bandi Amir, the lakes, up to Mazar Sharif and up to the Panjshir Valley to see these extraordinary sites. And we ran quite a few trips between 2005. I think the last time we ran this trip for security reasons um, was 2016, I think, if memory serves. The other trip that we've run probably more often recently is the Wakhan Corridor trip, which is the little turtle's head I was talking about in my intro, where we come into Dushanbe in Tajikistan and we travel down the Kar uh, the Karakorum Highway, listen to me, the, um, the Pamir Highway down to Ishkashim, where we cross the border into Afghanistan and then travel up the Wakhan uh, Corridor to Shahadi Borigil, um, and all the way up to Lake Chakmatin, where you will meet the Waki people and Kyrgyz people, different kind of ethnic groups that have got cut off up there in this very remote part of Afghanistan. So that is um, the first part of the talk. Um, I hope you've enjoyed my little reminisce of traveling in Afghanistan back in, uh, back in those days. Um, and of course, what you could do there um, well, up until fairly recently. What I should say, because I know people will be curious about this, um, and, and we do have two full tours booked for next year to the Wakan Corridor, is that at the moment these tours have obviously been suspended. We're waiting to see kind of how the dust settles, um, and we'll be making a decision on the 2022 trips um, in, in the new year. We have just launched 2023 trips, 
uh, so that we have a bit of time to kind of get that organized. So let's talk about